start here. So thank you for joining us. This is the sixth seminar in the Plant Phenome Journal monthly webinar series. Uh, I'm Seth Murray. I'm an associate professor at Texas A&M and uh, one of the editors at the Plant Phenome Journal. And just to let everybody know, uh, this uh, is one of, uh, again, six seminars, and some of the past ones were successfully recorded. And you can find those uh, on uh, our YouTube channel or at the Plant Phenome Journal. Um, if you want to just search for that, it's pretty easy to find. And you can also read some cutting edge uh, articles that are starting to be published in the Plant Phenome Journal. Um, so today I'm, I'm very excited to uh, introduce a, a dear colleague and a, a great researcher. Dr. Michael Gore is an associate professor at Cornell University. He's also one of the uh, editors at the Plant Phenome Journal. Uh, before he uh, took his job at Cornell University, he was actually at the USDA ARS as a research geneticist. Uh, and before that, a, a grad student at Cornell in the Plant Breeding and Genetics Department where I got to know him. So Mike uh, is going to be talking today about the great outdoors, the application of field-based phenotyping to improve crop resiliency. And uh, if anybody has any questions they want to prepare as they go, please just type them in the chat section uh, and I will read them at the end and I'll make that announcement again. So without any further delay, uh, Dr. Michael Gore. Thank you very much, Seth. Murray for that wonderful introduction. It was far too kind, sir. So today's presentation, as Seth said, is going to be about high throughput phenotyping in the plant sciences. And just to kind of give everyone a perspective for maybe on where I'm coming from. So as Seth was saying, I uh, graduated pretty close to the same time he did from Cornell with our PhDs in 2009. Seth graduated 2008, I believe. And at, at that time, we were kind of beginning to be part of what I define as like the next generation DNA sequencing revolution. And, you know, it was really exciting to be a graduate student at that time when you were now being able to think about the capability of doing whole genome resequencing. And so when I think about for my PhD began, you know, the first year, doing targeted candidate gene resequencing. And then the final year of my PhD, we were um, in 2008, 2009, we were essentially finally able to do, you know, whole genome resequencing um, at a fairly low cost. And of course that cost has been driven down a lot more. And as Seth was saying, I used to work for the USD ARS in Maricopa, Arizona. And one of the ideas I had at the time was essentially try to take the lab to the, the field. And so I've been thinking about, you know, high throughput phenotyping probably for a, about 10 years. And I'm just going to kind of give you what I, I kind of have been thinking about it and where I kind of see the field going in the future. So with that, I was hired uh, by the USD ARS in 2009 to work on improving the resiliency of cotton to heat and drought stress. So here, if, if you look at the cotton belt, you see the um, regions of the U.S. where there's a, a great amount of cotton harvested every year. And then you see the, a map to the right here in 2011. And this is the U.S. drought where it caused $2 billion in economic loss in cotton production. So cotton, just like with every other potential crop grown in the U.S. and in various places throughout the world is threatened by, you know, the increasing variable patterns of changing weather and uh, diminishing freshwater resources that growers maybe have access to. And this is a picture from, from Texas during the 2011 drought. And as I began thinking about what my contribution could be to help farmers such as um, in this photo here, is how do we rapidly develop resilient crops? And this, this is, I think, one of the, the great challenges we have. And when you think about how you turn that engine of evolution very rapidly in plant breeding populations, we think about the, the genotyping side and we think about the phenotyping side. And putting them together, we can begin developing genomic selection models. So when you think about using GS to do faster development of like stress resilient crop varieties, you, of course you have your training population that's been genotyped and phenotyped. And on that data set, you train your genomic selection model, which I'll hear for brevity, I'll just refer to as the GS model. 
And then you have your testing population, which has been only been genotyped and you're breeding material here. And then you use that train prediction model to predict the unobserved phenotype. And then you calculate your GEBV, which is your genomic estimated breeding value, and you make selections based on the GEBVs. And so where the phenotyping comes into play, even though, you know, I think there's maybe certain points of view that, oh, phenotyping is less important when it comes to genomic selection, it actually is still very important. We still need highly accurate and precise phenotyping to train those GS models and to also retrain the, the GS model after various cycles of selection as, as it needs to be updated. And here we have classic field phenotyping. So you can just kind of view this as people have been phenotyping crops for over the past 10,000 or more years. And, you know, it's often said phenotype is, phenotyping is a bottleneck, but it has been a bottleneck for a very long time. It just has become more highly relevant since we have, in a sense, solved the, the genotyping side. And the classic phenotyping as, as you know, as we walk the plots, it is time intensive, a very limited amount of data is often collected, and that leads to small sample sizes, just a few time points. There's often a trade bias as breeders may only focus on the traits that are most visually scored, and this costs, it can be very expensive because you may need a, a small army of individuals going out to the field to poke and prod plants to collect that phenotypic data. And here is um, my colleague, Mike Salvucci, former research leader of mine, uh, working for the USDA ARS in Maricopa. And here he is with a Lycor 6400 looking at um, photosynthetic traits in Pima cotton. Great information that can be derived from these approaches, but it's very low throughput and labor intensive. But some of those like actual data streams that we're able to derive from a light course 6400 that is, is valuable for when you're trying to improve cotton for tolerance to heat and drought stress would be transpiration rate E here and leaf temperature here. And here we have two treatments like a wet and dry and the wet being the control. So you can just kind of view this as the wet being the control, the dry, the, the drought, and the transpiration rate is, is lower for the uh, plots that are growing under drought stress and transpiration rate is higher for the, the plots, i.e. the Pima cotton plants that are growing under well water conditions. And also in turn, the canopy temperature, or in this case, the leaf temperature is higher for the, the drought stress plots and lower for the canopy temperature uh, for the control wet plots. So in, in this case, when there's a, a drought, the plant is going to try to conserve as much soil water. And so the transpiration rate is going to decrease and in turn, the leaf temperature is going to increase. And this is um, a thermal image of one of those uh, cotton plants here. And as the, the canopy temperature is heating up, you're also able to, to see that in this thermal image here. So field-based hydrobrid phenotyping, FBHDP, uh, ideally it should reduce you know, the human effort, result in a higher amount of data collected, have large sample sizes, should be possible, be able to have many time points, there should be less of a trait bias, so you should have, be able to more ob objectively score certain phenotypes, and it should be a lower cost over time. So in a sense, the other thinking about this is you're able to put your phenotyping on a time axis throughout the growing season. And one of our first um, uh, attempts here at high throughput phenotyping was the developing of this high clearance tractor with um, certain equipment and sensors that we have mounted on this toolbar, toolbar here. And this is, I think, a prime example of, of a group of plant scientists humbling themselves and working with a group of very talented engineers and being able to try to address uh, the, the problem of how can we collectively you know, analyze hundreds of plots in a time-sensitive fashion and collect uh, through like sensor fusion 
multiple streams of phenotypic information. And here we have our crop circles, which is collecting NDVI, it's a vegetation index, and the canopy temperature collected by the infrared thermometers and the ultrasonic transducers to measure canopy height. And we have also GPS RTK antenna and GPS RTK receiver and radio, and everything is logged in, in this certain model here was the Campbell Scientific Data Logger is a CR1000 and a CR3000. So as you know, we have this sense of fusion, it's collecting all this phenotypic information, we're able to link it with the, the GPS string and so that every phenotypic data point that we collect from the field with the tractor can be, in a sense, geolocated to a certain point in a plot and ideally to the resolution of a single plant in a plot. And so when we first began using this platform, as you would expect, we wanted to compare to the um, perhaps highly precise at the time, but very low throughput phenotyping tools that we had been using. So when we were looking at the canopy temperature data, and this was data taken from um, a set of 25 Pima cotton varieties that were growing under two treatments, wet and dry, and there were four replicates. And so here we have on the x-axis is the leaf relative water content, and on the y-axis is canopy temperature. And in the, the red are, are the dry, the drought plots, and in the blue points there are, are the the wet plots. And so what this is basically showing is through the canopy temperature that was collected through the tractor, it's uh, this phenotypic data is highly correlated with leaf relative water content in, in that if the canopy temperature is higher, then the leaf relative water content of the plant is lower and vice versa. If, if the leaf relative water content is high, the canopy temperature is, is lower. So in this case, the plants that are going, um, growing under the, the dry drought conditions are choosing to conserve their water. They're going to shut their stomates down. Transpiration rate is going to decrease. Soil moisture is going to be retained. But in turn, the, the canopy temperature also, i.e. the leaf temperature is going to increase. And we also, through the crop circle there, um, is looking at spectral reflectance, and this is the normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI, and this is measuring biomass, but it can also be used in this case, as we have found, to measure leaf wilting rate. And to calculate leaf wilting rate, it was NDVI for the wet plots, subtract NDVI for the dry plots over NDVI for the, the wet. And so what you see in this uh, figure here, we have on the x-axis time of day, and the NDVI calculation is near infrared, subtract uh, red, and near infrared plus red. And, and a near infrared in this case is at 820, and red is at 670 nanometers. And this is time of day. And so what's happening is as you're driving the tractor over top of the plots over this time course, as the leaves become more droopy, i.e. as we, they, they begin to wilt, there is more soil exposed up through the, the canopy. And also you're changing the, the reflectance of the, uh, from the leaf themselves as you, you have these leaves droopy. So in a sense, that's why this NDVI value is changing over time. So whereas compared to 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. here, the, the plants at 3 p.m. are going to be very wilted and relative to the wet con control plots are going to have a lower NDVI value. So this was a, a way to use um, a standard you know, vegetation index NDVI, which in, is in a sense quantifying greenness, to really understand the rate of leaf wilting rate in, in this population of Pima cotton lines. And here we have in this plot is uh, broad sense heritability, but you could also view it as repeatability. And here we have July 21st, August 4th, and August 18th. The, um, the traits for like such as height is HT here. This is a trait that's you know, highly repeatable, isn't changing very much over the growing season 
where if you look at a trade such as NDVI on July 21st, this is before canopy closure and when there was like an ex extreme drought e event, essentially the leaves got more wilted, they were very droopy and more soil was coming through the um, canopy when the tractor was driving over top. And that's why the, the repeatability here is in a sense there's more noise in that phenotypic data and we weren't able to regress out the soil contamination. One, one thing to point out, July 21st for the canopy temperature, which is TM, and August 4th, which is TM, and then August 8th, TM for canopy temperature. For, for the July 21st, um, repeatability you see here is actually somewhat variable and um, at 1 p.m. on July 21st for, for the drought treatment is very low so that was before canopy closure so there's a lot of soil coming through there and so that the um, canopy temperature values are actually very high from the soil contamination. On August 4th we, we actually did have good canopy closure but there was a clogging of the drip tape and in this case, the change in canopy temperature was highly re reflective of that clogging of the drip tape. So once the, the drip tape was um, unclogged, when you flush it with um, sulfuric acid, that's what is in a sense ca capitulated in August 18th, where you, and now we have the um, canopy temperature is highly repeatable over that time course within that single day. So a trait like canopy temperature is highly dynamic and obviously it's, it can re reflect phenotypic variability of the actual population, but it can also reflect certain signatures related to crop management as well. And so now in a sense, we you know, validated the system, the traits are, are re repeatable, they had a high broad sense heritability. We wanted to begin use this tractor-based platform to do QTL mapping across uh, recombinant inbred lion populations of 95 rills and uh, the tractor itself was going to do phenotype from canopy temperature again, canopy NDBI and canopy height. We did the typical agronomic traits where we did lint yield, bull size, fiber quality, and we also did a physiological leaf trait through um, quantification with ELISA and that's epsizic acid concentration. And this was a managed stress uh, field trial where we had soil neutron probes in the field to calculate how much like soil water is in the, the field and some of the plots are across the field and we were also using drip irrigation and we were using the FAO 56 crop replacement model to calculate how much um, irrigation should be applied to the wet and dry regimes and uh, the dry here which is since the, the drought treatment was receiving half as much water as as the wet control treatment and on the next slide here is what you see is the geoprocessing of the canopy temperature and these data reveal distinct patterns between and within irrigation regimes and so here we have our dry rep one wet rep one dry rep two and wet rep two. And this um, blue color that you see up top here for wet rep two, that has uh, a cooler canopy temperature for these plots. And then you can see the, the alleys in between the, the plots that are like green. So those that it assists is like ex exposed soil. And then you can see variation within the plots for, for the, the dry, the drought treatments as well. If you look down in towards the uh, right corner here, you'll see dry rep one and you'll see some part of, of the field that actually has blue. So in this part of the field, when we used an EM38, you looked at the electrical conductivity of the soil, we actually found this part of the field had a higher clay content. And one of the considerations is, and I've said this before, is that there's more soil variation than phenotypic variation often within the populations that breeders are selecting on. So in this three year trial here, we would always rotate the, the orders of the plots within these different borders here in these reps and we would also change um, the, the locations of where we would actually have the wet and dry treatments as well to, to try to break up that confounding. And we were also use autoregressive models AR1 by AR1 to, to control for that 
spatial variability. And so the work can, that I'll be showing now for the QTL mapping was carried out by Dr. Duke Pauli, who is now an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. And so here he's, he's showing that canopy temperature is in fact highly heritable and shows transgressive variation compared to the, the phenotypic value of the two parents, and those two parents being TM1 and NM24016 right here. With the field-based high throughput phenotyping trap platform that we have here, we were able to phenotype key cotton plant developmental stages over the, the growing season. So just to kind of walk you through what we have here, at the beginning of the season, we have our course, our trials planted. There was equal irrigation applied to both treatments at the, the time. And, and to reduce kind of the interaction with um, phenology and the timing of when the drought treatment was applied, we applied the drought treatment when over half of the population, or i.e. the plots, were at first flower. And that's when we began doing the phenotyping of canopy temperature, canopy NDVI, and canopy height at four time points within a single day. And we did the phenotyping one, one day per week. And so the irrigation, as I said, was imposed at flowering. And some of the different stages we, had, we were able to focus on was bull development, fiber maturation phases, and at the end of the season, we were able to collect yield and fiber quality traits. And here is, in a sense, like your 1,000-foot view of canopy temperature over the whole growing season in 2012. And you can look to see how it's broken up across the different cotton developmental stages going from flowering peak bloom to bull and development and fill to fiber development and elongation. And here we have the four time points, 7 a.m., 10 a.m., 1 p.m., and 3 p.m. And our irrigation treatments here, dry is red, so that's our drought, and wet is blue, that's our control. And if you look on the x-axis here, this is the canopy temperature here, and you can see within each of these different time uh, periods within a single day, the phenotypic variance is increasing as you go from 7 to 10 to 1 p.m., and then it's slightly decreasing at 3 p.m. So what this is, in a sense, typifying, and this is very typical for, like, of all of the different days we did phenotyping over the, the three years, canopy temperature has a repeatable dynamic response within a day across the growing season. And we were able to use these data over these three years to do QTL mapping, and we were able to find distinct temporal patterns of QTL effects that were controlling variation in canopy temperature. So if you look at the x-axis of each of these graphs here, we have the, the first is the, the dry drought treatment. So here, this is just QTL mapping within that irrigation treatment regime. So that's just dry. And for the wet here, this is just the irrigation regime, well watered, wet, and this is QTL mapping within here. And for, for the red coloring within these um, plots here, this is where an allelic effect is increasing tam canopy temperature, and where it's blue, this is where it's an allelic effect that's decreasing canopy temperature. And on the y-axis here, this is day of year. And then you can see a um, horizontal line here where it's broken up into each of the three years for 2010, 2011, and 2012. So what you can then begin seeing here, if you can see my cursor, is that as, so in this case, day 216, there was, was a QTL that was, in a sense, turned on, and it's now expressed all the way Towards, towards harvest, and that QTL allele from that particular parent is increasing canopy temperature. So in a sense, when you see like these con continuous lines that are all of the same color, you can see that's where the QTL is turned on, and then like the intensity of that color relates to the LOD score, which then also in turn relates to the e effect size. So you, you can see how it's there could be gradients with, within the growing season for like that single QTL being turned on and off and in, in terms of in intensity of that QTL. Now with every QTL study, you can always find a candidate gene. So 
this is a very large interval here on this one chromosomal region, but when you look into this genomic region, we found a, an interesting candidate gene called abscisic acid response element binding factor, and this gene uh, co-localized for when we mapped uh, the phenotype leaf ABA content. So these two QTLs, in a sense, are mapping to the same genomic position. And why that is very intriguing, since um, we mapped canopy temperature and then leaf ABA, is that it's well known that when the cells are turgent, the stomata are open, so the transpiration is high. So in a sense, the canopy cooling would also be high. But as ABA is being made, and it's um, causing the stomata to then close in the sense the cells are flaccid and transpiration rate is going to decrease and in turn the canopy temperature would in increase. So this is a very viable candidate gene and so if anyone wants to follow up on it, by all means, you, you have my blessing, go for it. And so now we want to think about more of the applied side. So we have all this canopy temperature information what can we use in terms of trying to figure out what is the most predictive time point within the growing season and within a single day that could be predictive of lint yield? And so this is where we're using lasso re regression and what the acronym lasso is, is least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. So in a sense, this is doing variable selection to prevent overfitting. And so in this first plot here, this is hour of importance, and it seems like at the 10 a.m., 1 p.m., and 3 p.m., these times are having a high importance. And then in terms of day of importance, day 208, day 208 is most important out of all of these days that were phenotyped, and it just so happens day 208 occurs with flowering and peak bloom. And then this far right plot right here is just comparing canopy temperature, canopy height, and NDVI to see their predictive ability for lint yield. And in fact, canopy temperature had more of a predictive Im importance, if you will, compared to canopy height and NDVI. And so what this all means then is when, when you look at lint yield here on the, the x-axis, ranging from 0 to 1400 kilograms per hectare and on the y-axis here is temperature degrees celsius and in the the red here these are the the dry plots right here and the um polynomial regression here has an r square of 0 0.30 and then the polynomial regression for the wet control plots is 0 0.18 and so what, what this is right away telling you is that an increased transpiration rate under drought stress is contributing to higher yield in irrigated hot air and environment. So these, these lines that in a sense take a risk that, that they choose to continue to fix carbon to have a high transpiration rate so that they can have a lower canopy temperature, they're the ones that are going to be higher yielding. And this may actually obviously work well in a hot arid environment that's highly irrigated. And when it's under, you know, the well water control conditions, there really is no ad advantage, if you will, for having that high transpiration rate. It, it was only really seen when, when we imposed that drought stress. And so this is kind of re typifies at, at this per particular time point that canopy temperature at flowering peak bloom is most predictive of lint yield, but it's certainly not going to explain all the variation for, for yield because yield is a polygenic trait. And so this is this one, if you will, trait component that can be used to explain yield. And why this may be important when we think about canopy temperature is, is the fertility of the, the pollen itself. So if we look at this top uh, image here, this is an image of a heat tolerant fertile flower, and you can see the, the nice pollen covering the anthers, and on, on the bottom is the heat-sensitive flower, and you do not see any, any pollen covering the anthers. And in this case, the plant itself is very st st uh, sterile. And, and so when you think about that in terms of canopy cooling, if you're able to have a much cooler canopy, then very likely the pollen itself is also going to be fertile still, and it won't be sterile. 
And so that, that caused us to begin thinking about, well, maybe we should be thinking about yield in terms of counting flowers on a plant or bowls at the end of the season. And that's where LIDAR comes into play. And LIDAR is, in a sense, like an optical remote sensing approach. So you're going to measure the distance to or, or other properties of a target by um, trying to shine a pulse of light on that target, such as with a layer. And here we have like an oblique view of cotton plants that were surveyed with a LIDAR in 2014. And we are able to visualize this point cloud with the software cloud compare. And what we're actually seeing here is um, a defoliated cotton field. And these, these are one of the, the reps that we were using for QTL mapping. And here we have the, um, like a, a single plot, and these are the cotton plants from that plot. And what you see here are like clustering of cloud points, and those clustering of cloud points are the actual cotton bowls on the, the plant itself. And then you can pull out like a single, if you will, GPS slice from that plot and use the Euclidean clustering approach to actually count the cotton bowls on that plant. So this is the, the first vignette that I will end here on some of my USDA cotton work with all, all my great colleagues at the USDA ARS in Maricopa. And now the, for the second vignette, it will focus on some of the maze work that we've been using with convolutional neural networks here at Cornell. And it all began with a question. And that question was, which of these symptoms on maize leaves is caused by northern leaf blight? That may sound like a very simple question to even the most skilled plant pathologist, but for someone like me that is maybe using this as a tool in a breeding program where I'm not trained as a highly skilled plant pathologist, it becomes a very challenging problem. And so even if you're a plant pathologist and you need to like train a large team of undergraduates, to go and do all this phenotyping for say NLB in a maize field, you may show them a couple of plants, but then they go out to the field and they begin phenotyping on their own. It may become very challenged when you look at cases like this. And in all of these cases, really it's the um, image up in the top far left that is actually NLB and all, all the rest of these e examples here are not NLB. So this work I'll be presenting here for our NSF NRI project was carried out by two very uh, talented graduate students, Chad DeChant at Columbia University and Hod Lipson's lab, and Tier Wisner Hanks at Cornell University and Rebecca Nelson's lab. And so one of the, the, the factors for, for carrying out this work is that NLB causes severe yield loss in maize. So NLB is this foliar disease in maize caused by this fungus. And it causes these gray-brown necrotic lesions on affected leaves. And these lesions can actually grow and coalesce over the growing season, as you see in this image here. In the US and Ontario, it's estimated that yield losses from NLB are on the rise. And, and in 2015, as you see in this graph here, NLB accounted for 25% of all yield losses from disease. And that equates to $1.9 billion. And, here you can see the, the contribution of NLB to disease loss in 2015, 550 million bushels. So visual assessment of disease incidence. So you can just think of this as presence absence and so severity. And you can think of severity as like disease leaf area. And this is like quantitative. So if it's present, so that's like qualitative. So verity is quantitative. Either way, they can be time consuming and prone to error um, when you have a human doing the phenotyping out in the field. So even though you may be trying to score the presence or absence of, of a lesion, it can be slow to try to really truly figure out what the true positives is for the NLB lesion versus the true negative. And when you get into more of a quantitative disease scoring, such as disease leaf area, it becomes even more imprecise. And here we are looking at the mean intra-rater variability of 0.762. So you can just think this is the same individual going to the same plots, but the only difference is perhaps they did one phenotyping and say in week 10 and one 
phenotyping in week 12. So they may be only separated by two weeks at the same individual doing the phenotyping and the correlation between those two replications is only 0.76. And the inter, I-N-T-E-R, rate of repeatability is even lower than 0.76. So this is imprecise here when we're thinking about quantitative disease scoring. So this is where image-based phenotyping for NLB disease um, using convolutional neural networks with CNNs is a possible alternative approach. And just to kind of walk you through what we see here, first, uh, you know, just to kind of give you like a broad overview, you can kind of think of the CNN as converting pixels into words. So in this case, we, we, we have this pixels of the input image on the left, and we're just trying to figure out, does this image have a lesion? or not. So you can think of it in terms of logistic regression as one zero lesion, no lesion. And that's what we refer to here as the logistic unit. And so the CNN is in a sense extracting these multiple layers of nonlinear features. And then there's this classifier that's combining all these features to make predictions. Okay. And when you see the word convolution, you should just kind of think of that as applying a filter across an image and it's detecting certain features. And then there's this pooling approach, which is in a sense just going to simplify the, the layers. And in, where the actual learning actually happens is, is on um, part four here. This is where weights are progressively optimized using a back propagation approach which is you know, estimating how these changes in the filter weights would uh, affect the amount of final error. And um, it's also in incorporating this technique called gradient descent, where you're optimizing the algorithm. So what gradient descent is doing is really adjusting these filters to reduce the amount of error. And so also by having the CNN, it allows a network to learn features that are invariant to the exact location in an image. So, so the idea is you train these CNNs, they can work on any image that perhaps they have not seen before and have been trained on. And so the idea now is using these CNNs combined with UAVs for, you know, for a rapid and accurate detection of NLB lesions on maize leaves in, in the field. And the whole concept is, you know, we have these uh, autonomous robots, if, if you will, that being the, the UAV. And as these deep learning ch chips are getting cheaper, you can put that in a drone. And as time goes on, eventually the thought process is you can do real-time image processing to detect in real-time a uh, disease lesion in the field and that you can then tell a, a grower that there's a possible disease breakout happening. And then you can also think if you had a fleet of drones, you can track um, disease spread over a, a field. And this is kind of the drone view or UAV view of what it, it would see from um, an infected cornfield. And here we have a disease lesion right here. But to be able to do that over hundreds of thousands of plants from a single image is um, obviously very challenging and that's where the CNN comes into play. So here we, I, I say one must first learn how to walk and because what we wanted to do first is in a sense take um, a lot of images with a handheld like Sony camera and to use these images for training CNNs that detect NLB lesions. So you can also maybe see this from the point of view of having uh, a, a ground vehicle going through through the field, but these are all photos here that, that I'm showing that were taken by, by Tier as, as he walked through through the field. So in terms of what the, the training set was, we have 1,028 images of NLB detected in infected leaves right here. And this is where the human annotation comes into play. You see these red ovals here. This is, I think, one of the hardest part is, in a sense, we, we haven't trained the AI to train itself, right? So the, the humans still have to do a lot of the annotation. The humans have to be you know, somewhat uh, aware and being able to tell what a lesion is and what a lesion is not. And this is where um, it takes 
a lot of time. And then we, we also had images of non-infected leads right here. There were 768 images here. And these different images represent or are supposed to represent a range of disease symptoms, background, and lighting conditions. And we, we had two fields of, of the maze G to F genomes to, to field, and each of these reps had 250 hybrids. One rep was artificially inoculated with NLB, the other rep was not. But we still tried to take um, infected and non-infected in, in, in photos from all of those fields so that we wouldn't have like a training bias. So how, how this work is, works is there are three stages of classifications in this pipeline. And so first we have uh, the 1,028 images of the infected leaves. And then there's uh, 760 images, if you recall, of the non-infected leaves. So they were like randomly divided into 70% of the images here that were used for, for training after the human annotation. And those are fit to the model. Then you have the 15% here that are used for validation. And this is really used to estimate the prediction error for the model and hyperparameter selection. And then you have a 15% here for the test set. So you can kind of view this as being kept in uh, a safe and it isn't used for training at all. And this is really used to assess the error of the final chosen model. So in, in stage one here, we train several CNNs to detect the presence of the lesions and like the, the small patches of the images here. And then those CNNs that work well were used in the second stage to produce these heat maps. And these heat maps here that you see black versus white here, and then you see different shades of gray. So that's indicating the probability of infection of each region of the image. And then in this third final stage, that is where we are using all of the heat maps from this three NNs. We're combining them to classify the full image. And just, just um, as a reminder, this is just presence absence right now. Either an image contains an NLB lesion or it does not. So in final uh, stage three of the network, I was trained on the combinations of the heat map. We achieved the highest accuracy on the validation set here. And in this case, we have the input CNN A, B, and, and C. And, and this is, and this column here is the accuracy when training on the sub images. So it ranges from 0.81 to 0.9. So that's all from stage one. And then accuracy when training on the heat maps all from stage three, it ranged from 0.88 to 0.8 to, I'm sorry, to 0.91. And then we, when we combined all this three, it was 0.98. But then the accuracy on the test set, which if you recall was like held out, that had an accuracy of 0.97. Okay, so stages one and three accuracies here, we're calculating using the validation images. And then the, the kind of the, the take home, if you will, the accuracy on this test set is 0.97. And that accuracy was calculated using the, the final holdout test. Okay. So in general, and when people are, are training these CNNs, they trained on tens of thousands of different images. And in our case, we only were training on only just under 2,000. 2, but these are some of the, the false positives that, that we had found in the first stage. And as you see here, there's many different types of dead leaves, variation in, in the lighting, insects, leaves in the background that were posing challenges to the CNN. And so the, you know, these are the image subsections that you see here that were mistakenly classified as containing a lesion by the classifier in the first stage. But we then use this information for re retraining. Um, and then since these are known false positives, and we, we had um, used that to Im improve our classifiers in the final system. And so just to give you an, an idea of what this looks like here, here we, we have, say, an, an image. Now, just keep in mind, this image has not been um, cut into the different subsections. 
And after we, we run the terrain CNN on it, what you see here is a heat map. And white here is if there has a probability one of a lesion being detected, black has a probability of zero of a lesion being detected. So here it, it looks pretty clean if you were to Im impose these white um, pixels here over to like the brown lesions of the RGB photo on the left. In, in this case, um, below, this is a non-infected NLB plant. There are no lesions at all. And so we would pre presume hypothesize that our CNN has been trained well, it should become completely black. And in that case, it is. And this is, in a sense, kind of like the, the holdout test where we have the accuracy of almost improving. So one, one thing that's actually kind of humbling is as the uh, CNN has been trained even more, we have gone back and reran our training set and we actually found disease lesions that the humans missed. And so when we account for those lesions that the human missed, our, our accuracy is now increased to over 98%. So that in a way is kind of humbling when the machine itself is doing better than the human being. But that's what we actually want over time. But that isn't to say that plant pathologists won't have a job forever. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. So what we're now doing is be getting to move to the UAV platform. And this obviously offers the opportunity to really speed up data collection and provide real-time disease detection. And this is our DGI 600 here, and we have our Sony Alpha A6000 camera here. And if, if you look here on the right, this is an image taken by our UAV, and you can see some really nice lesions on there. And so what we're doing now is the different annotations by human beings. And then once those annotations are finished, and I think Ethan and Tier are maybe up to maybe six to 8,000 now. So we almost have 10,000, and then we will use that to train our CNN. And this will be from the point of view of a UAV because we found challenges in trying to go from the CNN train with like the photos with the handheld camera. It didn't translate well to um, the images that were collected by the UAV. It's just kind of changing like the viewpoint and everything else. And so what Ethan Stewart in my lab is now doing a postdoc on this project. He's trying to develop a CNN that's estimating NLB disease severity. So this is more quantitative. And now this is a complete disclaimer here. This is just a cartoon example. This is not the product of a CNN. And the idea is if you use a thresholding approach, you figure out what the leaves are, what the soil is, and then you figure out what the area of the leaves that is actually the disease lesions, and then you can calculate disease leaf area. In this case, of COVID, it would come out to 25%. That's what we are actually trying to e evolve to at this point in time so that it can be from presence absence, but now to be able to do disease severity. And now we, what we've been thinking about is beginning to merge um, AI and robotics to uh, also assist in plant breeding programs from this disease point of view because the thing about the NLB disease, it starts at the lower part of the canopy and it goes and it goes up towards the top of the canopy. So by the time you kind of see it from the point of view of a UAV, it's I won't say it's too late, but really it kind of is almost too late to apply a fungicide. So the idea here is to begin incorporating these uh, unmanned ground vehicles with cameras as well to kind of complement the, the work we're doing with the UAVs. And this work um, is from our RPE DOE Terra project. And uh, this robot here is being developed by Grish Chowdhury's group at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And here what you see is um, 
this handsome robot here. This is one that's going to be used for a very, very tall biomass sorghum. And here it is going and being able to trans transverse plots. You know, it has cameras on there and other ways to, to sense various phenotypes. But the one that we've been focusing on is this one that's 3D printed. And it's obviously very cute. It can go in, in between the, the rows very nicely. And the, the idea is this, you can begin to integrate the UGV and UAV system, you know, to tandemly phenotype NLB disease incident and severity from the understory to the canopy. And we're going to begin doing this in summer 2018. And this uh, TerraSensha platform is from the company EarthSense. And the idea is going to be taught to be an autonomous robot so that it can be able to phenotype uh, quite a few different traits, including disease traits such as caused by NLB. And with that, I would like to thank all my wonderful colleagues at Columbia University, UIUC, EarthSense, University of Arizona, Cornell University, KSU, and uh, the colleagues that are also working on um, the, the BREAD project, which I didn't have a chance to talk about today, and all the funding agencies that have been able to fund this research over the past close to 10 years now. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, I'm sure everybody else is clapping as well. Um, so now uh, we'd, like <laughs> to, uh, we'd like to open it up to, uh, to questions. There's a couple different ways uh, that you can get your questions in. One is that there's a chat box. So if you want to just uh, type your question in there, I'll be happy to read it. Make sure you send it to everybody or at least send it to Seth Murray so I can read it out or to Mike Gore. Um, the other way is to unmute your microphone and go ahead and jump in. Uh, I found it usually takes a little while before somebody feels comfortable doing that. So um, let's, uh, let's thank Mike Gore again for a, for a great presentation. I especially appreciate that he, um, he made a recognition of how cute the one robot was. That was nice, Mike. Um, but very, I, very I always try to be fair to my friends that are robots. <laughs> okay, um, so I have, a, I have a long list of questions, but I don't want to take up uh, too much of your time. Um, so so w I guess one of the things that was really interesting to me that you showed at the very beginning was that the, uh, the most predictive of yield uh, for your cotton work was actually uh, at flowering and not at the end, which is a mm -hmm. little different than what we would expect and see. And I wonder if that's because the environment is so consistent in Arizona, because I mean, if you think about maize, uh, the yield potential is made even before flowering, but it's consistently losing uh, that yield potential throughout its growth as various stresses and whatnot impact it. I mean, is it a cotton thing or is it a, a environment stability thing or, or what do you think is going yeah, on? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, cotton is very much different from an annual grain crop, you know, cotton being essentially like a perennial tree treat it as a, a row crop and it doesn't just have like one flowering time it flowers and then it's finished right so i i think the fact that you know it's continually flowering over a certain period and i think the one caveat here as you interpret these data though is we began applying the drought stress at flowering right and and so and we didn't re record this but what I had, you know, could see by eye is that some of the, the, the lines that were not very heat or drought tolerant were dropping their cotton bowls as well, right? And I, so I, I think that also kind of plays into that. So if you have like, like the flower, it isn't, you know, being pollinated or it is fact pollinating, but then the plant itself drops its, its, its cotton bowl that seemed to be like the really critical time. So if, if you had like a, like maybe a type one or a type two high heat e event that co incurred with flowering and also drought stress, that's when it was really hammering the plant hard. Okay. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's, yeah. that's yeah, kind yeah. of my two, two cents. No. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's no way we can know, know for sure, but... Uh, no, uh, yeah. no, we can't. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat box here, so uh, if anybody has an oral question. I guess uh, I should have stuck to my script here, too. Normally, I, I, <laughs> okay. make, 
I'd make a plug for um, the next seminar, which will be uh, James Schnabel, who recently had an article uh, accepted in uh, the Plant Phenome Journal, and also uh, to submit your articles. And I think what Mike was highlighting here, uh, especially in the in the second part of this talk, uh, are things that that are a definite fit with uh, the Plant Phenome Journal. Really innovative work combining engineering and and plant science. Um, since nobody's jumping in with a question, I've got another one for you, Mike. I know you work um, a lot in Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do these tools uh, for use in plant breeding compare um, to the genomics tools that I'm sure you're contacted by a lot of aspiring scientists from the developing world and, and Africa? Usually they want to work on genomics. How do you think these tools fit in in an African situation um, compared to genomics tools? That's, that's a really cool question. Thank you for asking that, Seth. So I think this ties in with our NSF bread project that I have with Jesse Poland. So Jesse Poland has been focusing on the, the wheat side and I've been focusing on the cassava side. And for our bread project, we've been focusing on smartphone apps for, for phenotyping and being able to integrate those apps with Fieldbook because, you know, Smartphones are maybe one of the most highly penetrant, you know, technology in in sub-Saharan Africa. So our philosophy has been we developed these very low-cost apps. We work closely with you know cassava and wheat breeders to you know train these AIs to get feedback from the breeders on how they should be improved, and then. The, the breeder is very much empowered because they have these apps and they're, you know, in a sense, almost customizable for their own breeding questions or, or breeding challenges that they have in their breeding program. So that's, that's kind of the approach that we have taken when it comes to that. But from, from what I've seen, I, I haven't seen like why adoption of like UAVs or UGVs in sub-Saharan African breeding programs. So that's why we've kind of focused on the like handheld apps right now. And I can maybe show this because I actually didn't know how much time I would have left. But um, this is with um, some colleagues at um, a university in Uganda. And so he, where I was talking about the CNNs that were being terrain for maize for NLB. Here we have um, like CNNs or deep learning algorithms that have been trained to detect cassava mosaic disease. So you can think about either a breeder or a smallholder farmer where they have a diseased plant and may be infected by a virus or infested by white flies. They can take an image and through, you know, like processing of that image on the phone or uploading that image to the cloud with, you know, with like GPS coordinates, they can get with a certain probability an actual diagnosis of that plant. So that's, that's where kind of the disease side comes in and play. And then in terms of like uh, other plant pests, um, also colleagues at the same university are developing and an app to count white flies, which is very, very challenging. So you can kind of think of these like white flies as like blobs, right? So here we, we have these like classifiers that are combining with these um, decision trees to actually count the white flies. And this, this is being Im improved over time. And one of the challenges that, that I've found um, when we were doing this in Nigeria last year is the white flies are actually underneath the leaf and so to kind of do the phenotyping you have to carefully turn the leaf over and ten, then take a picture of the the leaf without as you hear as you turn it over if, if you're not very slow the actual white flies be, begin to fly away and, and and this training set is being improved over time as well so that's that's kind of the uh, approach that we've taken so far Seth. That's super awesome. That's that's really cool work. Um, Thank you. I'm really disappointed. I see that there's a number of students and um, uh, online, and I I sure hope that they have a question for you, especially on the uh, the CNNs, because I think that's 
that's something we don't hear a lot about. Oh, great. Here we go. Uh, this is a comment um, from Mahendra. Uh, Thanks a lot for the wonderful talk, Dr. Gore. I was just wondering if we need to take into account the ambient air temperature when making canopy temperature uh, measurements to predict the yield, since air temperature causes variation in canopy temperature. Yeah, so there's different models where you can um, account for like um, vapor pressure deficit, ambient air temperature, and a few other factors as well, such as like the angle of the sun, you know, during like the time of day. And I think it, it is worthwhile to try to include your, those factors in your models. I'll be honest, when, when we tried it, it didn't really change our findings that much because, and I think the reason why is we were able to do our 400 plots in only like a half an hour. Now, if, if it took us maybe two or three hours to do all of our plots, I think the importance of those factors would probably be higher. Mm. Hey, Mahindra, I hope that, that answers your question. Um, any other questions? And remember to unmute your microphone. Okay, if not, I'll just ask one more. I'll limit myself to three questions. And, and um, <laughs> Very I'll good. A, a little bit of a tougher one this time, Mike. Uh oh. Um, and I asked Duke the same question. So, in the first part of your talk, uh, you found QTL. So, yep. uh, what do you do with those? I mean, I see the data was a little bit older uh, yeah. compared to what you were just presenting. So, has anybody followed up on these, or was it more just a, a case study and uh, nobody really knows how to actually use these or apply them? That's, yeah, that's, that's really a fair question. So, I think from my own point of view, Seth, is I always wanted to do, if you will, a time series of canopy temperature in a crop and then do the QTL mapping of that phenotype over time, right? And so this was, for, for me, kind of a proof of concept, right? But I would also hypothesize that this phenotype is probably polygenic. And so if one was to, to breed for it, I think you have to have, you know, these high throughput phenotyping platforms to really be able to capture that phenotypic variability in a short time window. But then in terms of the breeding for it, I think that's where like whole genome prediction would come into play. And so the, the QTL obviously is to try to figure out like the biology and the patterns of the, the gene control for this phenotype. So we have seen that. But if you want to begin breeding for it, I think you would pretty much want to go to like a GS model. And then I, I think from also what has been shown in wheat, you would combine the genotypic data with traits such as like canopy temperature or maybe a vegetation index into like a relationship matrix and then use that in a GS framework. So that's what I, I would probably do as like the uh, actual proof of concept, but actually being able to use that in a breeding framework. Yeah, I think I think that's fair, uh, fair, fair answer. I mean, it was it, it's a cool study. It's just uh, you know I know I have a lot of QTL in my program that we've never really followed up on, and and when it comes to those temporal ones, I can't imagine. I mean. It's already complicated enough, and you throw in temporal ones, and, and it gets really complicated pretty quick. Yeah, that, oh, no, that's, that's, that's totally right. That's totally right. Okay, well, um, we are after 12 o'clock, but I want to give one last chance for somebody to ask a question if they'd, if they'd like. Um, just go ahead and unmute your microphone. And hearing none... Let's give uh, Mike a round of applause, and I will see you next month for James Schnabel. Thank you, Mike. Excellent job. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure. And if anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to either call me or send me an email. Always happy to answer them. And you're not too hard to find. <laughs> uh, I'll take that as a compliment, I guess. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks. Have a great week. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.